Ladies and gentlemen. No, it doesn't. Ladies and gentlemen. Yes, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. He's on a, the administrator, uh, Chief Justice Keane of the Federal Court, Justice Mansfield, fellow judges and former judges of this court, uh, former administrators of this court, the police commissioner who I think is here, uh, the Solicitor General, presidents of the Law Society and the Bar Association, members of the family of Justice Crewalt, Jenny Bailey, Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the annual Crewalt lecture to be delivered today by Chief, the Chief Justice of the High Court, Robert French. Chief Justice French is a man of enormous scholarship and energy. As a reflection of his energy, when he was a member of the Federal Court, positioned outside his chambers, he had a large very large indeed, and I thought heroic photograph of himself running in the Rome Marathon. I repeat that for emphasis, the Rome Marathon. The photograph reveals a superbly conditioned athlete fighting and overcoming the elements. Think chariots of fire. It's a fine piece of work. His honour graduated from the University of Western Australia about the same time as myself. He graduated with a Bachelor of Science along with his Bachelor of Laws. He was admitted to practice in 1972 and as a measure of his talent and his success, he was appointed to the Federal Court at the very young age of 39 years. He was, as we all know, sworn in as the Chief Justice of the High Court on 1 September 2008. Since he was sworn in, his honour has continued to demonstrate the scholarship and vast energy to which I have referred. Apart from the, carrying the enormous workload which accompanies the position of being Chief Justice of the High Court of Australia, he found time to deliver at least 52 significant speeches between September 2008 and December 2010. I'm not sure what the number is today, but that is a major speech every two to three weeks, of course, on top of that very heavy load that is carried as a judge of the High Court and indeed as the Chief Justice of the High Court. I have heard some of those speeches and I have read many of them. They were each the subject of detailed research. They each displayed significant insight and wit and were entertaining. Justice Crewalt, after whom this lecture is named, also had an entertaining, entertaining side to his personality. He once employed the late John Withnall as his associate. A few years ago, John spoke as a warm-up act to this lecture and told us part of his role as an associate was to attend hotels with his honour and purchase the alcohol. The difficulty was that John was only 16 at the time. <laughs> However, Justice Crewalt resolved the problem by directing that whilst John was in his company, he was deemed to be 21 years of age. <laughs> I'm not sure that I would get away with that today. Justice Crewalt also had a scholarly side and thought deeply about the situation of Indigenous Australians and particularly the application of the criminal law to Aboriginal people. He offered views and made positive suggestions as to the application of the criminal law to Aboriginal people. Chief Justice French also has a long history of supporting Indigenous Australians. He helped found the Western Australian Aboriginal Legal Aid Service and whilst on the bench of the Federal Court was the first president of the National Native Title Tribunal. At the time of his swearing in as Chief Justice of the High Court, he referred to the long history of, of Indigenous Australia and said this, recognition of their presence is no mere platitude the history of Australia's indigenous people dwarfs in its temporal sweep the history that gave rise to the constitution under which this court was created. Our awareness and recognition of that history is becoming, if it has not already become, part of our national identity. I am delighted to have the Chief Justice here to address us today uh, and deliver the Crewalt lecture. 
the topic he has chosen is the Northern Territory, a celebration of constitutional history. Please welcome his honour. Thank you, Chief Justice. Um, Your Honour, the Administrator, uh, Chief Justice uh, Keane, uh, judges of the uh, Supreme Court of the Northern Territory and of the Federal Court, uh, distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I should immediately put to rest uh, any notion that the photograph of the uh, uh, near completion of the Rome Marathon, which hangs outside my chambers, is an exercise in self-congratulation. It shows me in uh, extremis at uh, 41 uh, kilometres, uh, uh, just about to beat someone from the uh, uh, team known as Diabetes America. <laughs> and several other uh, disabled persons who are running in the marathon. Uh, in fact, when Murray Gleeson, uh, my predecessor, visited the, uh, 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 our chambers in, uh, in Western Australia for uh, High Court circuits while I was still serving as a federal judge, he repeatedly uh, taxed me with the proposition upon looking at the photograph that I was actually walking, not running at the time, and I was trying to uh, demonstrate to him by reference to the relative positions of my feet, one flat, the other raised. In fact, I was running, but he was never convinced. Well, in one sense, uh, the occasion of a centenary is nothing special. It is an artefact of the means which we have adopted for measuring the passage of time by the Earth's orbit around the sun. Every instance of time since the first 100 years after the adoption of that measure has been the centenary of something. But despite its intrinsic triviality, we use the centenary as a device to review the past and to think about the future. 2011 is the centenary of the creation of the Northern Territory as the Territory of the Commonwealth of Australia and the creation of the Supreme Court of the Territory, which is celebrated in a, a book by Justice Dean Mildred, which I'll be, have the pleasure of launching a little later this evening. This lecture is a reflection upon the constitutional history of the Northern Territory and it is an occasion to think about the future. It is also an opportunity to honour the memory of one of the most distinguished members of the Supreme Court of the Northern Territory, Justice Martin Crewalt, who was a significant part of that history. I am delighted that members of his family are present. Martin Crewalt was born in South Australia in 1900, the son of a schoolmistress and a Lutheran pastor. His father had come to Australia from Wisconsin as a missionary in the 1890s. After his father's death in 1916, Martin returned to the United States and studied there for a time, then came back to South Australia, where he graduated from the University of Adelaide with bachelor's degrees in arts and law in 1923 and 1925. He practised as a solicitor and taught at Adelaide University, largely in the area of the law of property. He married twice and had five children. He was appointed to the Supreme Court of the Northern Territory in 1951 and died in office on the 12th of June 1960. The great Australian uh, con uh, constitutional scholar, Professor Geoffrey Saw, described him as one who possessed the virtues traditional in the Anglo-Australian judiciary, learning, wisdom, uprightness, fair-mindedness and a profound uh, sense of public duty. Uh, I was going to tell the story about how he visited uh, uh, hotels in Darwin accompanied by his associate who bought the beers, but that story has already been told. <laughs> That's therefore one less joke in this speech. <laughs> there are very few left. Uh, Justice Crewalt thought seriously about the relationship between Indigenous people and non-Indigenous society and its laws. Some of his views would be controversial today. Then again, it is difficult to express any views in this complex and difficult area that will not be thought controversial by somebody. He recognised the importance of cultural difference. He thought it appropriate to have regard to customary law in sentencing. He was aware of the difficulties confronted by traditional Indigenous witnesses in the understanding and use of the English language and in giving evidence. He might be surprised, and I suspect pleased to see the extent to which Indigenous cultural awareness programs, including such topics as Aboriginal English, are part of continuing judicial education across the country, funded by the Commonwealth and managed by the National Judicial College. 
just as Krebel's memory lives on uh, in his work and in uh, his recognition in this city. There is a set of chambers named after him in the city, a street named after him in Palmerston, and this annual lecture in his name. It is a privilege to deliver this lecture in honour of a distinguished member of the Supreme Court of the Territory, who made a major contribution to its jurisprudence and development as the third branch of Territory Government, and so to the constitutional development of the Territory itself. Let me then move to a, what we might call a national stories perspective before focusing particularly on the Territory. Australia is often referred to as the oldest continent. Some minerals in the um, uh, Mount Narria area of Western Australia have been dated back over four billion years. Microfossils and stromatolites found in the Pilbara are said to be among the earliest known life on Earth. Although the history of mankind is just the blink of an eye in the geological time scale, the Australian landscape is laced with the marks and records of human occupation which stretch back over 40 or 50,000 years. That represents the period over which the Aboriginal people travelled to and occupied the Australian continent, beginning with Northern Australia until the whole landmass was occupied by their societies. They produced no written histories. Their dreaming, which frames their laws and customs, and their relationships to the landscape, its plants and animals, and to each other, was told through songs, traditions, ceremonies, extraordinary visual arts, and the kinetic arts of the dance. Their relationship to land was described movingly by Galaroy Unipingo, Unipingu in a letter from Black to White in 1976 when he wrote, the land is the art. I can paint, dance, create, and sing as my ancestors did before me. My people recorded these things about our land this way so that I and all others like me may do the same. I think of the land as the history of my nation. It tells us how we came into being and what system we must now live. My land is my foundation. Without land, I am nothing. A different perspective on land and a new story began with the arrival of the British colonisers. So on the 26th of January, 1788, Arthur Phillip annexed the eastern half of Australia in the name of the British Crown. That event was followed by successive annexations of the rest of the continent and the evolution and division of the colonies so created into six self-governing polities. The colonising culture collided traumatically with that of the indigenous inhabitants. The law of the colonisers, including the common law of England, was incapable of engaging meaningfully with the laws and customs of Aboriginal societies. In 1833, the Aboriginal people of New South Wales, which then encompassed the Northern Territory, were described by the Supreme Court of New South Wales as wandering tribes, living without certain habitation and without laws. This was the imperial judicial perspective on Australian Aborigines, also enunciated in 1889 by the Privy Council when it described the colony of New South Wales and by implication the rest of Australia as a tract of territory practically unoccupied without settled inhabitants or settled law at the time when it was peacefully annexed to the British Dominions. The reality on the ground was exposed by the 1971 judgment of Sir Richard Blackburn in the Supreme Court of the Northern Territory in Malirapam and Nabalco. He had to decide whether Aboriginal native title could be recognised by the common law of Australia. He saw himself as bound by the view of history embedded um, in the common law as enunciated by the Privy Council in 1889. Nevertheless, on his own examination of the evidence put before him, concerning the traditional law and custom of the people of Gove, he found what he described as a, quote, subtle and elaborate system, highly adapted to the country in which the people led their lives, a system which he called a government of laws and not of men. That decision, although adverse to the people's claim, was a defeat which yielded a large result for Indigenous people generally in the Territory. It was the catalyst for the establishment of the Woodward Royal Commission and the development of a statutory land rights scheme for the Territory. That scheme, in turn, set the scene, through its repeated litigation, 
no less than 14 cases, I think, which went to the High Court uh, for the recognition of native title at common law in the 1992 Mabo decision. With that recognition came a constitutional shift away from the view of history propounded by the Privy Council in 1889. Indigenous occupation and British colonisation are two important parts of our history. Another important part is non-British migration. Since the second half of the 20th century, Australia has received waves of migrants of non-British origin from all over the world. They bring with them many different stories. Some have come seeking refuge from oppression and persecution. They represent a diversity of cultures and customs and outlooks which have enriched our society. They are reflected in the diversity of the people of the Northern Territory. Nearly one quarter of the people who live in Australia today uh, were born somewhere else. More than 40% of Australians were either born overseas or have at least one parent who was born overseas. The stories of our people, the indigenous, the colonisers, the migrants, the refugees, are all important chapters of our national history. Despite the dark moments of that history, there is much to celebrate. Australia is one of the world's most successful and stable representative democracies. It has institutions which we sometimes take for granted, lawmakers elected by the people, ministers and officials who are responsible to the elected lawmakers and ultimately to the people, and a judiciary with high standards of independence, competence and honesty. We have also a healthy and questioning scepticism about our institutions, which is a necessary part of a vibrant democracy. It doesn't accept the say-so of authority on matters of public importance and is expressed in many ways, including through national and regional media. It is good, however, from time to time, to remember those features of our society in which we can take some pride. In spite of its small population relative to the rest of the country, the Northern Territory has played a significant role in the constitutional history of the nation. That role may be understood by reflecting briefly upon the chronology of colonisation, federation, self-government and the developing understanding of the scope and limitations of Commonwealth powers with respect to the territories. The constitutional evolution of the Territory really begins with Arthur Phillips' proclamation of the colony of New South Wales in January 1788, which covered the area from, west, from the east coast of Australia to the 135th meridian, which passes close by Millingimby in Arnhem Land. That proclamation was the first step in the assertion by the British Crown of sovereignty over the land which is now the Northern Territory. The second step was Captain Bremer's establishment in 1824 of the military settlement at Port Fort Dundas on Melville Island. Uh, he took possession of the coast as far west as the 129th meridian. The third step was taken in 1828 when the inland boundary of New South Wales was also extended to the 129th meridian by Governor Darling of New South Wales. And that is the, the uh, uh, westernmost uh, uh, boundary of the Northern Territory. Uh, oddly enough, it's not just a matter of academic interest. When Justice John Mansfield was dealing with the Aluar native title claim uh, he, some years back, he was dealing with a, a claim which straddled those two meridians. And of course, the, the uh, thing which has to be established for the purpose of establishing native title is continuous connection with the land from the time of annexation. So there was a time gap of some uh, 40 years or so between the 135th meridian and the 129th meridian. Happily, nothing turned on it, as you might expect. A misstep occurred on 17th of February 1846 when the colony of North Australia was created by an order in council issued under the Australian Constitution Act of 1842, so you could have been part of Queensland. Um, Sir Charles Fitzroy was appointed uh, governor of that new colony, which comprised the Northern Territory and Queensland and part of New South Wales. However, the putative government was never established and on the 28th of December 1847, that order in council was revoked. Save for the interregnum, when it was uh, part of that short-lived uh, but non-functioning colony, the Northern Territory until 1863 was part of New South Wales. Then on the 6th of July 1863, by letters patent, Queen Victoria annexed the area known as the Northern Territory to the colony of South Australia. 
Robert Garron, Secretary of the uh, Commonwealth Attorney General's Department and one of Australia's leading constitutional scholars at the time of Federation, uh, in an opinion which he wrote in 1909 said, it appears clear that by the letters patent, the Northern Territory became part of the state of South Australia, although power was reserved to the Queen to detach it again from that colony. The annexation has been described uh, by uh, James Renwick in his history of the constitutional position of the Northern Territory uh, as um, an act unique in Australian constitutional history. Um, colonial expansion largely for pastoral purposes by another colony. It's perhaps ironic in light of South Australia's eventual surrender of the Northern Territory to the Commonwealth that it had a serious concern about whether the annexation would stick. In fact, South Australia made a request to the Colonial Secretary in Britain in 1888 that the annexation be made permanent because under the letters patent the Queen could revoke it. The request was refused. The Colonial Secretary in classically opaque bureaucratic language said that the Northern Territory was, quote, an integral part of South Australia, unquote. South Australia itself treated the Territory administratively as though it were a species of dependency. In fact, Sir Isaac Isaacs, in his judgment in Buchanan and the Commonwealth in 1913, described the effect of the annexation this way. He said, the Northern Territory, though annexed to South Australia, and in one sense a part of that political organism, was always known by the distinctive name of the Northern Territory. And in the official dispatches between the Government of South Australia and the Colonial Office, reference is made to South Australia proper and to the Northern Territory. The South Australian legislature then passed a, a Northern Territory Act. It made provision for the sale of land in the Territory so that it could fund the administration. Uh, the town of Palmerston, which later became Darwin, came into existence in 1869. The telegraph line from Adelaide to Palmerston was completed in 1872. And the administration of the Territory, originally conducted from Adelaide until 1874, was carried on from there on by a government resident. Uh, Dean Mildred, in his history of the Supreme Court, suggests that although South Australia assumed it had full constitutional power to deal with the Territory, the true legal position was not clear. And he pointed to a case in 1866 in which it was argued in the Supreme Court of South Australia that the court didn't have jurisdiction to hear the trial of a man accused with a murder in the Northern Territory. That argument was based on the proposition that the letters patent which had annexed the Northern Territory confined the authority of the South, Governor of South Australia to the existing limits of the colony of South Australia, and the Northern Territory remained subject to the Government of New South Wales. The case was resolved uh, not by judicial decision, but by the dropping of the prosecution. <laughs> and maybe somebody didn't want to find out the answer. Uh, initially, uh, the judicial presence here in uh, the Northern Territory was that of the Government resident, who also acted as special magistrate. The Supreme Court of uh, Adelaide, of South Australia, which was a long way away, decided to establish circuit sittings. Unhappily, the first circuit judge, Judge Waring, uh, died on the return voyage from Darwin to Adelaide in 1875 when his ship was broken up by a tropical storm. Uh, so instead of having circuits, they decided to set up a resident commissioner, and that happened in 1875, who was going to exercise the powers of a judge of the Supreme Court of South Australia. <coughs> And later on, in 84, that uh, Act was amended to provide for the appointment of a judge as a judge of the Northern Territory with the same powers and jurisdiction as a judge of the Supreme Court of South Australia. The first appointment was Justice Pater, described in the Northern Territory Times, and I'm grateful to Dean Mildred for this quotation, as a man of nervous, excitable temperament and hasty, violent temper, utterly unfitted for the position of judge. <laughs> I'm sure they're not like that now. Subsequently, in order to save money, South Australia decided to combine the functions of government resident and judge so that the one person held both offices. And they were occupied consecutively by Justice Dashwood, known as Northern Territory Charlie, 1892 to 1905, Justice Herbert from 1902 to 1910, and Justice Mitchell, who was appointed in 1910, and who was to become the first judge of the Supreme Court of the Northern Territory when it was established by Commonwealth Ordinance in 1911. Well, by the 1880s, uh, the movement to form an Australian Federation had well, well and truly begun. Each of the colonies had established self-government through a series of constitutions 
made under the authority of imperial statutes. And by that time, as Professor Darrell Lum wrote, the coexistence of six colonies on the Australian continent, independent of each other in local policies, though united by common law, nationality and similar institutions of government, could not be the basis for a permanent constitutional system. There was also, as the Constitutional Commission wrote in 1987, a self-confidence in Australia, largely due to economic prosperity and reinforced by Australian cricketers who were able to beat Britain at her own game. Australian artists, writers, poets and agricultural inventors were also emerging. Representatives of the colonies came together in the 1890s in a series of conventions to endeavour to agree upon a constitution for the creation of the Commonwealth. In, 80, in the 1897 session in Sydney, a South Australian delegate, Mr V.C. Solomon, proposed an amendment to the draft Imperial Act that was to be submitted to the Imperial Parliament and which was to give effect to the Australian Constitution, that is the proposed Commonwealth of Australia Constitution Act. The amendment he wanted to uh, propose was that the definition in the Act, in Clause 6 of that Act, of the area which comprised the Commonwealth of Australia included what he called the Northern Territory of South Australia. And he wanted that to be part of South Australia. One of the delegates was Isaac Isaacs and he asked, is that part now technically South Australian Territory? Mr Solomon thought that was a rather difficult question to answer, given that the 1863 annexation had been at the pleasure of Her Majesty. What he was worried about was that a doubt might arise about the right of electors in the Northern Territory portion of South Australia to a voice in the affairs of the Commonwealth. Well, his amendment was accepted. There's a certain irony in reflecting upon that discussion, having regard to the post-surrender history of the Northern Territory's representation in the Federal Parliament, the challenge to that representation, and the Territory's long, slow evolution towards self-government. Two provisions of the Constitution adopted by the colonial delegates have been pivotal in the constitutional history of the Territory. The first is Section 111, which provides that the Parliament of a State may surrender any part of the State to the Commonwealth, and upon such surrender and acceptance thereof by the Commonwealth, such part of the State shall become subject to the exclusive jurisdiction of the Commonwealth. The other is Section 122, which relevantly provides that the Parliament may make laws for the government of any territory surrendered by any state to and accepted by the Commonwealth, and may allow the representation of such territory in either House of the Parliament to the extent and on the terms which it thinks fit. Importantly, that section provided for the possibility that Australian territories might be represented in the Parliament. It did not confer any right to such representation. That was a matter for the Commonwealth Parliament to decide. Anyway, as a result of Mr Solomon's amendment to the Commonwealth of Australia Constitution Bill and its acceptance, the status of the Northern Territory at the time of Federation was expressly reflected in Clause 6 of the Imperial Statute. That clause listed the colonies entitled to become states of the new Commonwealth. And on that list was the colony of, quote, South Australia, including the Northern Territory of South Australia. Unquote. Upon the proclamation of the Constitution, as Sir Robert Garran wrote, South Australia became a state of the Commonwealth, and the state of South Australia clearly, in accordance with covering Clause 6, includes the Northern Territory. As part of a state, the Territory was part of the Commonwealth. There was a question still about what constituted the Commonwealth. In the course of argument in the Buchanan case in 1913, following the surrender of the Northern Territory to the Commonwealth, Justice Isaacs, then a judge of the High Court, asked the question, does the Commonwealth in Section 6 of the Constitution include a territory acquired by the Commonwealth? And that foreshadowed the important constitutional debate which would echo through the years about the extent to which the powers of the Commonwealth to make laws affecting the territory stand outside other provisions of the Constitution or are affected by constitutional guarantees and limitations. Anyway, as we know, the Commonwealth of Australia came into existence on the 1st of January 1901 
and the Northern Territory as part of the state of South Australia was then part of the Commonwealth. The residents of the Territory therefore began their life under the new constitution as residents of a state. The state of which they were part was entitled to all the same constitutional powers and protections and was subject to the same constitutional limitations as the other states. The Northern Territory, as part of South Australia, had statehood and continued to have statehood for the first 10 years of Federation. But change was in the air. In 1907, South Australia, which was finding its administration of the Territory financially burdensome, made an agreement with the Commonwealth under which it would surrender the Territory to the Commonwealth. And that surrender was effected under Section 111 of the Constitution. Under the agreement, the Commonwealth took over South Australia's loans in respect of the Territory, which exceeded £3 million. It also agreed to purchase the partly completed transcontinental railway from Adelaide to Darwin and promised to finish it. An attempt by South Australia in 1962 to compel the Commonwealth to honour that promise was rejected by the High Court on the basis that the Commonwealth had never promised to do the job within any particular time. Which means one needs to be very careful about the fine print. Three of the justices also held that the agreement was political and not legally enforceable. Both the Commonwealth and the state uh, uh, South Australian parliaments passed acts giving effect to their agreement and the Northern Territory became a territory of the Commonwealth on the 1st of January 1911. And on that day, its inhabitants ceased to be residents of a state and became subject to the legislative powers conferred on the Commonwealth Parliament by section 122 of the Constitution. Now, the Commonwealth Parliament's Northern Territory Administration Act, which was passed in 1910, passed under section 122 of the Constitution, provided for the government of the Territory by an administrator appointed by the Governor-General. The administrator was subject to ministerial direction. The laws of the Territory were ordinances, a species of subordinate legislation made by the Governor-General. This was government by Federal Minister. In Dean Mildred's book, there's a quotation from Dean Jenks, which sums up the effect of the surrender rather nicely. He said, the transfer of the Territory to the Commonwealth in 1911 removed all representation for Territorians ended local participation in policy making, and the style of administration was summed up by the portfolio of the administering authority, the Minister for External Affairs. The loss of statehood in 1911 meant that the Territory had no representation in Federal Parliament. But in 1922, uh, an Act of the Federal Parliament provided, was passed providing for a single non-voting member of the House of Representatives. The rights of that member were gradually expanded over the ensuing years, and in 1968, the Northern Territory's representative acquired full voting rights and the same immunities, privileges, and rights of the other members of the House of Representatives. Representation in the Senate was not achieved until 1973 with the enactment of the Senate Representation of Territories Act, which allowed for the election of two senators from the Northern Territory. And as many of you will recall, uh, those were in the turbulent times of the Whitlam government. Uh, the uh, bill for that uh, 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 change uh, was twice rejected by the Senate uh, and was part of the trigger for a double dissolution followed by an election and a joint sitting of both houses, after which it was passed. But that followed, was followed by a challenge to the validity of the Act based first upon the process that had been followed, leading to the double dissolution, and secondly upon whether in any event uh, the um, Territory's uh, power under section 122 uh, authorised the Parliament to allow voting representation for a Territory uh, in, the, uh, in the Senate. Uh, the argument being that section 7 of the Constitution, which provides for elections of members of the Senate, refers to the people of the, uh, of the states. Uh, in any event, the Court held both that the process was valid, which had led to the enactment of the Act, and that section 122 qualified the requirements of section 7. Sir Anthony Mason, uh, in his judgment in that case, which was a, a challenge brought by Western Australia, said, to the framers of the Constitution in 1900, the existing condition of the territories was not such as to suggest the immediate likelihood of their securing representation in either house. But the possibility of such a development occurring in the future was undeniable. The prospect of its occurrence was foreseen 
and in my view it found expression in section 122. Well, that was part of the road to representation. The road to self-government was long. In 1926, we had the territory divided into North and Central Australia to be administered by government residents with partly elected advisory councils, that by operation of Commonwealth law. But that failed because it was too expensive and it was a time of economic hardship, and the Act was repealed in 1931. The Territory's representative in the House of Representatives moved a motion in 1931 to amend the Administration Act to create an advisory council with plenary power to make ordinances for the Territory with the consent of the Governor-General, but that was rejected in the Senate. From 1942 to 1947, the Territory was effectively under military control and governed by an administrator. However, in his 1943-44 report, the administrator recommended the creation of a legislative council with equal numbers of elected and nominated members and power to make ordinances on particular subjects subject to veto by the administrator. Uh, this was done in 1947. And then we saw established for the first time a legislative council in the territory which consisted of seven appointed members and six elected members with power to make ordinances in the classic words for the peace, order and good government of the Territory subject to assent by the Administrator or the pleasure of the Governor-General. Now the validity of that legislation and what that power involved was considered by Justice Crewalt in his decision in Namatjira and Rabi in 1958. The Council passed a welfare ordinance under which the Administrator could declare an Aboriginal person to be a ward if that person stood in need of special care and assistance. The effect of such a declaration was to impose major restrictions on the ward's liberties, including freedom of movement, residence, association, cohabitation and marriage. When one looks at the effect of such declarations, one wonders why people get excited about control orders. By a block declaration, every Aboriginal in the Territory, save for six, was declared to be a ward. Albert Nam Namajira was one of the six who was not so declared. He was charged with supplying alcohol to an Aboriginal who was a ward. In his defence, the validity of the welfare ordinance was challenged. One of the arguments advanced was that the Commonwealth, Government, uh, Commonwealth Parliament could not validly delegate legislative power to the Council. It should have made the laws itself under section 122. Justice Crewalt rejected that argument he placed his conclusion in the context of the progression of the Territory towards statehood and said, in the passage of the Northern Territory to statehood, two steps have been taken in the legislative field. A, legislation by the Governor-General and B, legislation by a Legislative Council with a majority of nominated members. Further steps bringing the Legislative Council nearer in status and power to a State Parliament will, I have no doubt, be taken and be necessary before the Northern Territory takes its place as one of the states of the Commonwealth. In my opinion, section 122 of the Constitution does not prohibit the gradual advance towards statehood. He also rejected an argument of a kind which has been raised on a number of occasions in different contexts that the ordinance was not for the peace, order and good government of the Territory. The composition of the Legislative Council was uh, be, uh, made a little more democratic in 1959 it was expanded to eight elected members, six official members, and three appointed non-members. An Administrator's Council was formed, which acted as an advisory body to the Administrator and as a precursor to the creation of an Executive Council. The Commonwealth still retained its power to disallow ordinances and its absolute control of the Executive Government, and it frequently did disallow ordinances without really giving much of an explanation. The Legislative Council was replaced by a fully elected Legislative Assembly of 19 members in 1974. And the Administrators Council now comprised the Administrator and five elected members. In the same year, a joint committee on the Northern Territory's constitutional development delivered a report proposing that a Northern Territory Executive be established with responsibility for statutory authorities and boards and an increasing number of what were called state-type functions then controlled by the Commonwealth. Uh, the uh, committee maintained its recommendations even after the disruption and devastation inflicted by Cyclone Tracy. 
uh, and an executive council was then established with effect from January 1977 to assist the administrator in governing the territory in such matters as the formulation of policies and plans and the activities of public servants. In July 1977, the Commonwealth Government announced at last its intention to grant self-government to the Territory, and that self-government commenced with the enactment of the Northern Territory Self-Government Act of 1978. Under that Act, the Territory was established as a body politic under the Crown, a Legislative Assembly was created, similar in composition and powers to its predecessor, and it received from the Commonwealth Parliament the, the grant in the historic terms of legislative power power to make laws for the peace, order and good government of the Northern Territory. The executive government was to consist of ministers drawn from and responsible to the local legislature presided over by the administrators. There were limitations on the lawmaking powers. The Assembly could not make a law, for example, acquiring property other than on just terms. There was a guarantee of free trade, similar to that in section 92 of the Constitution. Importantly, the grant of legislative power to the Territory did not qualify or reduce the power of the Commonwealth under section 122. It could still make laws for the Territory. Executive power was divided between the Northern Territory Ministry and the Commonwealth Minister. The Supreme Court of the Territory, which had continued, uh, had continued under the Supreme Court Ordinance 1911 until that ordinance was repealed in 1961, and the court re-established by Commonwealth law under the Northern Territory Supreme Court Act of 1961. It continued to operate under that Act until 1979, when the uh, uh, Supreme Court Act 1979 of the Northern Territory was passed by the Legislative Assembly. And in that year, the Office of Chief Justice was created, replacing the previous Office of Chief Judge, which had been established in 1975, and whose only incumbent was the much-revered Sir William Foster. The power of the Commonwealth to endow the Territory with separate political, representative and administrative institutions and control of its own finances had been uh, asserted by the High Court in Berwick Limited and Grey. The establishment of the Northern Territory as a self-governing polity was no less effective because it came from the exercise of Commonwealth legislative power than the constitutions of the Australian colonies in the 19th century which derived from imperial statutes. The position today, then, is that the Northern Territory has in place the constitutional infrastructure for statehood. It has a legislature, and an, an executive, and an independent judiciary. It has representative democracy and responsible government. But constitutionally, it is not a state. There is a qualitative difference between a self-governing territory and a state under the Constitution. There are specific provisions in the Commonwealth Constitution relating to the constitutions of the states, the powers of state parliaments and the saving of state laws. The Self-Government Act is a law of the Commonwealth. In theory, it can be amended or repealed by the Parliament of the Commonwealth, although that theory is, of course, a long way from practical reality. But it is an inescapable aspect of the constitutional relationship that the Commonwealth still has the power to make laws under section 122 affecting the territory that it could not make with respect to the states. An ongoing question is, how large is that power today? Not long after Federation, Quick and Garren, in their commentary on the new constitution, took the view that the position of the Commonwealth Parliament with respect to its territories was that of a quasi-sovereign government and that it could rule the territory as a dependency, providing for its local municipal government as well as for its national government. Robert Garron, in an article published in 1935, said that the Commonwealth's power under section 122 was not affected by limits on other legislative powers. Professor Harrison Moore, in writing in 1910, regarded the Commonwealth Parliament as having all the powers of a unitary government over the territories. That early idea that the territory's power under section 122 stood apart from the other legislative powers of the Commonwealth attracted the label the disparate power theory and was reflected in decisions of the High Court during the first 50 years of Federation. As Professor Leslie Zions wrote in 1966, on this reasoning, the provisions and doctrines relating to such things as the separation of powers, free trade, religious freedom, compensation for acquisition of property, 
jury trials and life appointments for judges are not applicable to the territories. They do not limit the full sovereign power given to the Commonwealth by section 122. Associated with this approach are usually statements that distinguish between the territories and the Commonwealth proper and state that the territories are not part of or fused with the Commonwealth. In the Boilermakers case in 1956, the Privy Council said that section 122 was a disparate and non-federal matter. However, a significant departure from that theory occurred in the year following the decision in Boilermakers. In Lambshed and Lake, the court held that a law of the Commonwealth made under section 122 of the, in, in respect of a territory could also have effect in a state. Chief Justice Dixon, in that case, discussed the relationship between laws made under section 122 and other parts of the constitution affecting legislative power. He could see no reason why the guarantee of religious freedom and the prohibition against establishment of a religion under section 116 could not apply to such laws. Justice Kitto spoke of the need to adopt an interpretation of section 122 which would treat the constitution as one coherent instrument for the government of the federation and not as two constitutions, one for the federation and the other for its territories. The integrationist view was stated um, forcefully by Justice Menzies in 1965 in a case called Spratt and Hermes when he said, to me it seems in inescapable that territories of the Commonwealth are part of the Commonwealth of Australia and I find myself unable to grasp how what is part of the Commonwealth is not part of the federal system. On the other hand, in 1969, the court held in respect of Papua New Guinea in a case called Teori Tau, that the power of the Commonwealth to make laws acquiring property in a territory was not limited by the constitutional requirement that uh, applicable to other con uh, Commonwealth laws that just terms be paid. The question of the interaction between section 122 and that just terms requirement arose recently in the decision of the High Court in Wirradjil and the Commonwealth. As you will all know, that case involved a challenge to the validity of a Commonwealth law supporting the Northern Territory intervention. The question was whether a law creating in favour of the Commonwealth statutory five-year leases over Aboriginal land was an acquisition of Aboriginal property and had to comply with section 5131 of the Constitution requiring just terms. The court by majority overruled its 1969 decision, which was the Teori Tower case, that the guarantee did not extend to the territories. As a result of that decision, Commonwealth laws operating in the territories are subject to the requirements of section 5131. That is to say, the people of the territory have the same protection in respect of the acquisition of their property by a Commonwealth law as do the peoples of the states. There's a similar protection, as I mentioned, built into the Self-Government Act in respect of territory laws. There are, of course, many unanswered questions about the interaction between section 122 and other provisions of the Commonwealth Constitution. There have been a number of decisions of the High Court touching on some of those questions. Importantly, some of those cases have established that a court of the territory is a court which may exercise the federal, the judicial power of the Commonwealth if invested with federal jurisdiction by laws made by the Commonwealth Parliament. It follows that such a court must be and appear to be an independent and impartial tribunal, which means that the courts of the territory have the same protections against legislative um, impairment of their independence and impartiality as the courts of the Australian states. As far as the Northern Territory is concerned, however, questions about the limits of Commonwealth power under section 122 uh, may arise from time to time unless and until the territory becomes a state of the Commonwealth. The questions raised by those cases to which I've referred and others have provided an opportunity for judges, practitioners, legislators and scholars to reflect upon the long-standing question about the nature of the Commonwealth and the essential unity of its people, whether they live in a state or territory. I have no doubt that the perspective of many Territorians is that they are fully paid up members of the Commonwealth and should be treated as such. The Territory is in one sense poised to become a state. Whether it does and when it does and on what, and on what terms it does will depend a great deal upon the people of the Territory. No doubt there will be debate about the terms of a constitution. Should it simply reflect existing arrangements and leave room for change? 
Should it include some aspirational statements? Should it include provisions recognising Indigenous people and their connection with the land? Constitutions are, of course, important. But whether they work well or not is critically dependent upon the people, the electors, those whom they elect, and those who are appointed to operate the constitutional institutions. It's good in that context to remember the words of Dr Ambedkar, who chaired the committee which drafted the Indian Constitution, one of the longest in the world. I think it has 328 sections. On the 25th of November 1949, the day before that constitution came into effect, he said, I feel however good a constitution may be, it is sure to turn out bad because those who are called to work it happen to be a bad lot. However bad a constitution may be, it may turn out to be good if those who are called to work it happen to be a good lot. The Northern Territory, in the hundred years of its existence as a territory of the Commonwealth, has played a significant part in Australia's constitutional history. It has reached a stage in its constitutional development when it is equipped with the constitutional infrastructure necessary for statehood, an elected legislature, responsible government, and a well-established and well-respected judiciary with 100 he years of history behind it. I expect that by the time the next centenary comes around, the Northern Territory will have many years of statehood behind it, and as a state, will have made its own contribution to constitutional practice and no doubt litigation in the field of Commonwealth state relations. Well, thank you, Chief Justice, for that illuminating discussion of the broad sweep of constitutional history here in the Northern Territory, placing it in the context of the rest of Australia. We now know where we stand. We know now what our constitutional position is, and I suppose the next question is, where do we go from here? And that is a topic which is very much exercising the minds of uh, the people of the Northern Territory, and we trust other people throughout Australia. And of course, it's not a matter on which I'm going to comment, but uh, it is a huge topic for the Northern Territory at the moment. Um, Your Honour has provided us with a, an insightful look at the constitutional history and position of the Northern Territory and for that we thank you and I would ask you to put your hands together again. Now what is now going to happen is that uh, we're going outside and His Honour is going to unveil my portrait. <laughs> I've asked him to be careful. Um, I should warn those of you who have children that uh, at the appropriate time you should shield their eyes in case they are traumatised by what they see. Ladies and gentlemen, we invite you to come outside, enjoy some refreshments and have a look at this portrait. Thank you. <laughs> If I could ask His Honour Chief Justice French to unveil the portrait of His Honour Chief Justice Riley. Thank you, Justice Southwood. Uh, uh, the last uh, portrait which uh, I unveiled, the only other portrait which I've ever unveiled, was that of uh, Chief Justice Higgins of the Australian Capital Territory Supreme Court, who had um, asked the uh, uh, painter uh, to um, uh, depict him uh, ten years younger than he actually was. Uh, this was uh, effective. Having had a look at what uh, appears uh, uh, from the print, and I haven't seen the original of the portrait myself yet, of um, Chief Justice Riley's portrait, I must say that uh, as with the uh, quality of the uh, other portraits by the same artist which appear above the entrance to Court 1, it is a work of the highest standard. Uh, and uh, that is a, um, a tribute to the work of uh, uh, Daniel Bergstrom, who has already a very high reputation. Uh, she was um, uh, uh, born in Sydney in 1957. She studied at the Julian Ashton School of Art and did a Bachelor of Art Education at the Alexander Mackey College of Advanced Education. She has exhibited in solo and group shows since 1980, including the Portia Geach Memorial Award 
the Doug Moran Portrait Prize, the Kadamba Drawing Prize and the Archibald Prize. Her work is represented in collections in Australia and overseas, including the National Portrait Gallery of Australia. One of her uh, uh, paintings is of the Australian actor uh, Jack Thompson, um, which was an entry for the Archibald Prize in uh, 2007. He said that he cried when he saw himself in her entry for the Archibald Prize. Now, I asked Chief Justice Riley whether <laughs> this painting had brought tears to his eyes, and he's assured me that it didn't. So I'll take him on faith, he being Chief Justice of the Territory and, uh, as I know him, an honourable uh, an man. Uh, my sense of looking at his portrait that you'll see in a minute is that it's much better than the portrait, well, from some points of view, that was painted of me. Uh, my associate, uh, one of my associates at the time that he saw my portrait, which is in the High Court in uh, Canberra, uh, said of it, and it was done by an excellent artist, and I, I liked the work a lot, but my associate said to me, you look 15 years older and sick. <laughs> I said to my associate, I'll grow into it. <laughs> but uh, this work, I think, is, uh, I don't know whether portraits capture character, but my sense is, looking at what you're about to see, that portrait does. Now, I'm told that in order to unveil it, uh, I have to pull very lightly or the whole curtain will come down. So you can have a few moments of excitement while I test the process. I, I was going to say that uh, he's half the man he was, <laughs> but I think that would be inappropriate. I'm sure that, that somebody with the appropriate technical skills will enable you to see this excellent work in its full glory in a few minutes, but I'm not going to risk further damage. Thank you, and uh, uh, I uh, commend the portrait to your, to your viewing.